contact point. So now we'll know where on the pile we are. And what we can do is a contact dot point, which is simply a vector. We want to compare the x, the x coordinate of the contact point minus our transform dot position dot x. This is the um, this is the the English that we're going to apply to the ball, which is a term people use to you know mean that sort of that sort of spin, that sort of lateral motion that we're going to apply. Um, and so we're just going to convert this into a force onto the ball. And ball, of course, is contact dot other collider. But we don't want to affect the collider. We want to affect the physics object of it, which is the rigid body. And these are all constantly refer referencing one another. There's a couple of different ways we may want to cache these into variables because these calls are not free to, to figure out which you know rigid body is connected to what and whatever. But here, you know, don't premature optimization is the root of all evil. Don't don't hurt yourself doing that. So we've got the rigid body. We're going to add a force. And again, we're going to use this sort of format. We're going to be adding some kind of force in the x coordinate. Let's uh, I don't know, 300 was working pretty well before. So this times the English and 0, 0. So if the ball strikes the paddle directly in the middle, then it's not going to add any sort of lateral motion whatsoever. But if it hits it towards the right or the left, then it's going to fire off at a slightly more severe angle. And to illustrate that or test it more easily, we're going to go back to our ball script and make sure that our ball starts off going straight up and down. So now, unless I've done it wrong, any syntax errors? No. If we hit play, it should go straight up and then bounce straight down and then keep going. Excellent. And now if I move slightly over here, then the ball is going to hit and fire off to the side, which is exactly what we want. So now we've got a little bit of control over where the ball is going to go. And this is very, very typical of this kind of game. Good. Looks excellent. So the next thing we want to do is work on having the bricks die, because of course that's an important part of the game. And yeah, this always happens in these sorts of games. You keep adding that sort of lateral motion and speed, and there you go. You can sort of arrest it just a little bit. We're also at some point going to have to make sure our, our board, our paddle can't leave the game area. So we want the cubes to die next, the bricks to die next, which means of course we need another script. This is going to be the brick script, and boy, I hope I don't have to say that too often because that's a little bit challenging to say. And our bricks, really don't have much going on, except they're also going to need an on collision enter uh, collision. Really, they're, I don't think they're even going to use the collision object, frankly. We're just going to do a destroy, and we're going to destroy our current game object, as in the brick is going to kill itself. That's it. Hit play, and nothing happens. Do you guys know why? I know why. This happens all the time to me. I, of course, forgot to apply the brick script to the bricks. Now, I should be able to drag it from here to the hierarchy. Let's go and find out. I'm going to drag it to the bottom one. So the bottom one has a brick script. And if I go up to the next one, nope, no script. So what I could do is from here, I could say, oh, apply this to the prefab, and then it would all get it. Or if I undo here, uh, or let's just remove it because I realized I... When you undo, it'll also undo like selections. So I'd hit back. So I've removed that script. What I can do is take this brick script and drag it directly to the brick prefab. So now the prefab has the script, and so do all the others. So now if we run this, hey, hey. Well, look at that. Now we're starting to get pretty damn close to having a game. Now, let's say we're not happy with, I don't know, the, the paddle movement. Okay, We're not happy with the speed. Now, what we could do, or what we'd have to do right now, the speed of the paddle, what is it, what is it controlled by? Well, really, it's this 10F right now. Well, that's hard-coded in. And in the middle of a function, that's not very good. Clearly, at the very least, what we want to do is maybe do something like um, move it out to a paddle speed out here. Right? We could do that and do that. And that works fine. We're still having to change the number. If we decide we want the paddle to move 50% you know, faster, we could change it to a 15 here. But we're still messing around with code. And one of the things that Unity does pretty well is if we set this to be a public variable, and then switch back to the editor, and select our paddle, and look at the script here, you can see now it's actually got a value here for the paddle speed, which we can change. We could change this to, say, 20 in here, and hit play. 
And now the paddle, oof, it's quite zippy. In fact, a little bit too fast to control. But we can even change this. Let me pause, just so I don't lose my ball. And unpause. And now it's really fast. I don't actually have to pause. It was just for convenience. I hit 10. And now, now it's much more manageable. You can change these values during the gameplay. One of the only gotchas, well, first of all, when I unpaused, or when I stopped the game, it went back to the actual value from before the gameplay, which is 20. So before I started tweaking things, that's one got you. And obviously, it doesn't change the code in your, it doesn't change the value in your actual program code. And what's also quite confusing is, let's say I set this to 100. I wanted a really, really, really fast paddle. I saved. I go back over here. The script has been recompiled, but this value has not changed. And this is what's still going to be used. And this happens to me all the time. So I'm moving at a 20 now, not 100. This happens to me all the time where I'm here. I'm like, what? Well, why isn't this change taking effect? Well, it's because it's public, and now it's part of this panel. Um, so if you're a programmer, a pure programmer, you may not want to take advantage of this too, too much. You probably want to do more like this because you're going to be tweaking this number here, and you don't want to be confused by the fact that there's a number there. You can see I, I took away the public, so now it no longer shows up in the inspector. And we're back to our much more reasonable speed of 10. All right. So really, the next thing we've got to do is, um, I guess, a scoreboard. I mean, that, that, what else are you missing for a game? Um, the ball's got to die, reset itself. Um, there is one other thing in that this is not generally how these games start with the ball already going. Usually, they start with the ball stuck to the paddle. You can move the paddle somewhere, and then you can hit, usually, say, space, for example, to launch the ball. Um, some games will also have power-ups, uh, like a sort of a sticky or a magnetic type power-up, where if you did something like, say, held shift down, then it would enable the stickiness of your paddle, and when the ball next touched, it would stop there and stick again, and then you could reposition it. It's a very nice, handy power-up to have. Speaking of power-ups, you could also have things that change the size of your paddle, maybe give you additional balls, which tends to be a pretty temporary power-up, because I can't bounce like three balls at once in this game, but in the meantime, it kills a lot of stuff. Maybe uh, you could change it so that instead of bouncing off the, uh, the bricks, it just burns right through them, uh, which is actually more of a change of the bricks property than anything, maybe. I don't know. I mean, you're really, you're really removing the collision ability of the ball, and you're turning it into more of a trigger. See, is trigger? Well, I'm not sure actually how that's going to interact with the rigid body and things. I'm going to have to uh, run a couple of quick tests um, before I tell you any more lies about the actual s solution. But Because really, at that point, you're going to want the ball to go to ignore the collisions and almost pass right through the brick, and then the brick still disappear when there's a there's a contact made but you don't want it to have a physics engine contact so there's a little bit of fiddle faddle going on there that you're going to want to customize but it's looking pretty good so far guys